So the slippery slope argument. Um, I said that, remember, rule utilitarianism was concerned that a rule that permits euthanasia would result in very bad consequences down the line. And this is largely what the slippery slope argument says. Voluntary, I'm, we use a shorthand in this argument, VAE, okay, just for typing purposes, VAE is voluntary active euthanasia. If the general acceptance or approval of voluntary active euthanasia leads to widespread abuses, in other words, unjustified killing, then the practice is morally wrong. The general acceptance or approval of VAE leads to widespread abuses, therefore VAE is wrong. The idea here is, is that if we accept voluntary active euthanasia as, as a rule, as we, if we accept that as morally permissible, we're going to end up having doctors um, moving from voluntary active euthanasia to non-voluntary or even involuntary active euthanasia. So the concern is, is that we are giving doctors more power than they should have and they're going to abuse that power and they're going to start killing patients who haven't asked to be killed. Or they're going to start killing patients that did not, are not in, you know, the last stages of their lives and need to die. We're going to have doctors who are making decisions that are not the decisions they're supposed to be making, and the practice of active euthanasia is going to ultimately be abused. And you can add to that that as a result of that, people are going to start to mistrust their doctors because they don't know if their doctor is going to decide that they're a hopeless case and, you know, Next time you get a vaccine, you get a dose of potassium chloride instead, and you're dead. So that's the slippery slope argument. Remember, slippery, sl slippery slope is a fallacy. So it's used quite often, but that doesn't make it necessarily a good one. So let's talk about Brock because Brock's response is to the slippery slope argument. First and foremost, whether we're talking about active euthanasia or passive euthanasia, the doctor's role is active. Whether the doctor is administering medicine or simply withholding treatment, the doctor is doing something. And so Brock says, we don't want to ignore that. The doctor is doing something in either one. Now, the slippery slope argument assumes that the doctors just want to go around willy-nilly killing people, okay? So the doctor, you know, the doctor could withhold treatment just as easily as he could administer medication, but the underlying assumption behind the slippery slope is that the doctors want to go around killing people that they want to go around making the decision, sorry, you're a hopeless case and now I'm gonna kill you. But that's just simply not the case. People don't wanna do that. Doctors, doctors don't wanna go around killing patients, okay? They, they prefer to save lives. And it's not that, oh, we think it's wrong to kill that's keeping them from killing patients. It's, they, that's not their job. But allowing euthanasia, active euthanasia, could help. And we could put measures in place, much like we have for passive euthanasia, okay? Passive euthanasia is morally permissible, but there are steps. Even in the case of an individual who doesn't have any family members, there are steps that can be gone through if somebody decides to withhold treatment, but there are a number of steps and it involves multiple doctors and, and maybe even court intervention. We accept passive euthanasia as generally morally permissible, but that doesn't mean doctors go around saying, sorry, I'm not gonna give you these antibiotics, you're just gonna have to die of the fever. 
they don't do that because that's not what they want to do. So it's reasonable to think that the abuse simply wouldn't happen. Okay. So between the fact that it's not the case that doctors want to go around killing people and the fact that we could put measures in place, measures that work for passive euthanasia, he says, it's reasonable to believe, at least in America, that this abuse would not happen and the slippery slope argument falls apart. Does that make sense? So Callahan gives us a, a different take on things. First and foremost, he says, you know, the debate itself is rather important because it has brought to the forefront a number of important questions. This debate started back in the 70s, or at least that's when it became particular, po particularly popular in society. Now, sure, technology had advanced to the point where we could do things like put people on respirators for an extended period of time. There wasn't, that technology is relatively new in human history. But that also brought the question of, is it okay to take that technology away? So one question is, when is it legitimate for one person to kill another? Okay. And notice that word is not murder, it's kill. And we do think there are cases, or many people think there are cases, when it's legitimate for one person to kill another. Things like self-defense come to mind. Um, so, you know, there are people who believe it's okay in war and so forth. Is it permissible for one person? Is it legitimate for one person to kill another in the case of the person having a debilitating disease that is bringing about the end of his or her life in utter horror, agony. What does self-determination mean? Okay, this is not a phrase we've talked a lot about as of yet in this lecture. Self-determination. I should have some level of determination in regards to the path of my life. OK, determination here is it doesn't mean I'm intent and I'm trying really hard. It's when it comes to determining the path of my life, I should get a say. OK, there are some things I don't get a say on. I don't get a say on being able to climb up to the roof, jump off and fly. OK, that's not something, you know, I just can't do that. Not without an apparatus of some sort. Right. But. I should have some say in the school I attend and the job I get, the people that I spend you know, my time with. I should have some say in that. The question becomes, do I also have some say in determining how my life ends? If I am suffering from cancer and I'm in a lot of pain and my prognosis is not good and another round of a debilitating medical treatment that only makes me sick and even more miserable is only going to add a few months to my life and those few months are going to be miserable. Do I get some say in determining how I spend the last bit of my life? Do I get some say, in other words, in how I die? And should medicine assist people in achieving their own view of the good life? This is that discussion again about what doctors 
job is, you know, what is the job of the doctor or the medical professionals? Is it merely to save lives and get and keep people alive? Are doctors and nurses only supposed to be prolonging life or are they supposed to be helping to enhance life? And in which case that might mean helping someone die. Does that make sense? So Callahan has responses to the four most popular or common, maybe I should say common arguments for euthanasia. One is the argument from self-determination. People have a right to direct their own lives and how they end. So a common argument for euthanasia is, the, is this notion that I get to some say in determining the path of my life, I should get some say in the ending of my life as well. But in active euthanasia, Callahan believes that I'm not actually exercising that right. I'm in fact handing it over to a doctor. Active euthanasia involves the doctor killing me. And if I say, I want my life to end, hey doc, help me out, kill me, I am not determining the end of my life, Callahan claims, because I'm handing the right to determine how I die over to my doctor. Now, presumably, I'm doing this voluntarily and I'm doing this knowingly. Um, so I, there's some question as to, to what degree that right is being handed over, but Callahan is quite concerned about this notion of handing rights over to the doctor. Then we have Rachel's claim there's no morally relevant difference between killing someone and letting them die. There's no relevant difference, morally relevant difference between killing someone and letting them die or between active euthanasia and passive euthanasia. Passive euthanasia is okay, so active euthanasia should be okay as well. But Callahan says that this confuses causality with culpability, okay? In passive euthanasia, the cause of death is the disease, okay? Nature is taking its course. But in active euthanasia, the cause of death is the doctor. We can't hold nature culpable for ending a life. Okay, we don't go around saying, okay, Mother Nature, I'm coming for you because you ended this person's life. We don't hold nature morally responsible. But in active euthanasia, the cause is not nature. We can't hold nature responsible, right? But the cause is the doctor, and that makes him or her culpable. There's, there, it's not in, in your textbook, but there's another article that offers a response to Rachel. And you may have been thinking this when we were talking about Rachel's, but <clears throat> the response is that the reason we hold Smith and Jones equally culpable for for their cousin's death is because they both had the intent to kill the cousin. The intent was to get rid of the cousin. So Jones is standing by and letting the child drown had a malicious intent to it. It's that intent that results in Jones being culpable. If Jones had not witness the child, you know, but had just come upon the child in the bathtub and maybe Jones was babysitting and maybe Jones should have been in the bathroom while the child was having the bath to prevent that the accident from happening. 
happening, but Jones never intended for the child to die. Jones pulls the child out of the water, attempts CPR, but the child dies anyways. We are less likely to hold Jones culpable in that scenario. It was an accident and Jones didn't have the intent. So the idea here is that intent in brings about culpability. So when the doctor intentionally administers the medication to kill the patient, the intent is not malicious, granted, because the doctor is not like, ooh, let's get rid of this guy, we don't like him. The doctor's intent is to ease the patient's suffering and, with any luck, abide by the patient's will for his life or her life to come to a quicker end. But because the intent is there, Callahan says that makes the doctor culpable. Nature doesn't have an intent. Nature is just nature. Does that make sense? Next is what I call the anti-slippery slope argument. Okay, this is Brock. All right, Brock's response to the slippery slope argument that, <clears throat> and it's a common response to the slippery slope argument that restrictions can be put in place to avoid these dire consequences. Restrictions can be put in place to avoid doctors abusing the power to kill their patients. And the bottom line is Callahan just doesn't think these restrictions are, are going to be practical. He just doesn't think that practically speaking, that we will be able to both construct and enforce regulations. So abuse is simply inevitable. Coming up with the regulations to monitor and regulate, I know that's redundant, but to coming up with these regulations for active euthanasia are going to be simply really, really, really hard. But enforcing it is going to be even harder. And so he just thinks abuse is inevitable. Doctors will abuse the, the power and we're going to have, you know, a really big problem. Uh, Brock had a point, though. It doesn't seem likely that, you know, doctors are really going to be interested in killing patients, you know. They don't want to do that. Are there bad seeds out there? Are there doctors who, you know, make really, really, really bad decisions and, you know, intentionally say, I'm just going to let this person die because it's been too long? We hope not. Is it an impossibility? No, there might be one or two, but usually that comes to light fairly easily and something's done about it. So again, Callahan just thinks abuse is inevitable, but there's some question as to does the underlying assumption of, you know, human nature and what doctors really want, is that a mistaken underlying assumption? Does that make sense? Finally, there's simply, there's this, the argument that medicine and euthanasia are in fact compatible. It's this notion that doctors aren't meant to just save lives or keep people alive, but doctors are supposed to be promoting the best life possible and that might include a peaceful death versus an agonizing one. So medicine and euthanasia are not incompatible. They are in fact compatible. Um, and Callahan, I think Callahan falls back on this notion of the doctrine of double effect. Look, easing suffering is one thing. But asking a doctor to judge another person's quality of life and administer medication to kill the patient is a whole separate thing. Again, you know, there's admittedly, 
the notion that the act of euthanasia is voluntary um, is the sort of thing that we kind of think, okay, but the patient's got some say here. Of course, Callahan is also convinced there will be abuse and doctors will do that in non-voluntary situations and possibly even involuntary situations, which would, everybody says, be very, very wrong. Involuntary active euthanasia is basically murder. So if the doctor's easing suffering, and that maybe hastens death a little bit, you know, instead of living for four days, the patient lives for two, that's one thing. But asking a doctor to say, you know what, your quality of life is awful, I, I grant that, and my other doctors agree, so we're going to say, sure, it's okay for us to kill you, Callahan just thinks that's too much. You know, and maybe, maybe he is, maybe it is, at least in physician-assisted suicide, you know, the patient is given the medication and the patient can make, makes that final decision to swallow the pills and, and that's that. But in active euthanasia, the patient doesn't get that opportunity because the doctor is administering the medication. Does that affect the morality of active euthanasia? It's hard to say. All right. Well, if uh, you need any help with this, send me an email. Just remember to sign your emails. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to get in touch with me uh, via email or give me a call. And of course, rewind and re-listen if you need to. Have a great day.